Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back down in the studio, and we're going to be having the second uh, episode in our series on Remington's Army and Navy revolvers. And the subject today is going to be Remington's cartridge conversion revolvers. Now, we're not going to be talking about the um, two-piece cylinders, you know, where you have the front part of the cylinder, put the cartridges in, and then there's a backing with uh, um, with the ratchets on it and with firing pins. And the reason we're not going to talk about those is because they were not done as conversions on the Army or the Navy model. They were only done on the smaller frame revolvers, the pocket models, the belt models, and the police models. And they're valid conversions, but uh, not not for the Army and Navy. For the Army and Navy, we had much more formal conversions. This one I'm showing you here is the actual Navy revolver conversion. This is an original. And it's quite different from the two-piece cylinders, obviously. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. By the end of the Civil War, there really wasn't anyone who didn't realize that the uh, the days of loading cap and ball revolvers with loose powder and ball or paper cartridges was passe. That the future belonged to metallic cartridge shooting revolvers and rifles. And in fact, by the time the Civil War was done, uh, muzzle loading rifles, particularly for military use, were, for all intents and purposes, finished. The Henry and the Spencer. Uh, particularly, had shown that metallic cartridges were the way to go. And in the post-Civil War era, all the government wanted to do was convert existing stocks of muzzleloading rifles to fire cartridges. So we can really say, with the end of the Civil War, the muzzleloading era, for all intents and purposes, was done on long arms. Now, revolvers ended up being a whole different story, because, as most of you are aware, Roland White had filed a patent for, among other things, loading cartridges and board through cylinders. And Smith & Wesson acquired the license on that patent from Roland White, and they were the sole producers of metallic cartridge firing revolvers in the United States during the Civil War. And all of their stuff was, was fairly small caliber stuff, um, mostly 32 uh, rimfire. So, Roland White's patent was the only thing retarding the complete turnover of uh, the handgun industry to metallic cartridges. And that patent, uh, Roland White had requested an extension on it, and he was turned down, and it was due to expire in either 1869 or 1872, depending on which authority you follow on this. Uh, I tend to go with the 1869. I've, I've actually seen more references to that. And as we talk about Remington's behavior, it fits better in the 1869 box than it does in the 1872 box. So this was a situation in early 1867 when Benjamin Kitteridge, who was one of the nation's largest firearms wholesalers, surveyed the handgun market landscape and said to himself, this is ripe for big bore metallic cartridge firing revolvers. And he realized that the only impediment to that was Roland White's patent. So he went off to Smith & Wesson and he said, look, I can acquire a large number of surplus Remington New Model Army revolvers. They can be had for like a dollar twenty-five, I think. So he said, "I can acquire a large number of those, and I would like you to convert them, and I would be willing to pay you a royalty to use the Roland White patent." And Smith and Wesson was interested, uh, and they actually started negotiating with Kitteridge. At first, they wanted a dollar twenty-five per gun, but they said to Kitteridge, "Look, we're interested, 
but we're busy. We can't do the conversions here ourselves. We recommend that you go talk to Remington and you ask them to perform the conversions on their revolvers and they can pay us the royalty. Okay, so that's exactly what Kittredge did. He went to Remington and he sat down and, and he said, here's what I'd like you to do. Can you do it? And Remington, who was desperate for funds at that time, said, yes, sir. <laughs> and, uh, and those were going to be the first army conversions. So Kittredge went out and he bought on the surplus market about 5,000 new model army revolvers, which he was able to get dirt cheap. He had negotiated a deal with Remington to convert them to 46 caliber rimfire cartridges. And the total cost of that conversion was going to be $3.50, of which $1 was going to be the licensing fee, and Remington would pay that to Smith & Wesson. And then they would charge Kitteridge the $3.50, and Kitteridge would charge whatever he wanted on the open market for those guns because they sold like hotcakes. Now the revolvers made for that deal fired a 46 rimfire cartridge and they discovered pretty quickly that they could not fit six 46 rimfire cartridges into the size of a current Remington cylinder. So they uh, changed them to five shots. Changed the timing a little bit and went to the races with five shot 46 caliber rimfire conversion revolvers. So obviously what Remington had to do to perform the conversion was to machine a new five shot cylinder, bore it all the way through, and of course that was somewhat going to be somewhat shorter than the original cylinder. To take up that space they made a 3 seconds inch wide conversion plate that dovetailed in in front of the recoil shield. And it was slotted where the hammer was going to come through so that the percussion hammer was able to hit the 46 uh, rimfire cartridge rim and set it off. There was no loading gate. There was a loading trough that was machined into the right recoil shield. But in point of fact, if you pointed that gun up and cocked it, a round would fall out. So you couldn't do that because there was no, no gate there. And I know that for a fact because I have uh, shot, not originals of that, but custom made replicas, uh, Master Gunsmith built replicas of that Remington conversion. Uh, and I can tell you exactly how it operates. So with, with no loading gate on it, you had to be careful with it. Now in ordinary use, when the gun's cocked or the hammer was already down, all the way down, uh, no chamber lined up exactly with that trough, so nothing could fall out if you pointed it up. But when you cocked it, if you were pointing up, when the cylinder revolved around and it got to that empty space, a shell just fell out. So between September of 1868 and April of 1869, Kitteridge ran about 4,700 of these New Model Armies through Remington for conversions, which they then sold on the open market. Uh, and as I said, they were quite popular. Now collectors call these Smith & Wesson Remington conversions, or Remington slash Smith & Wesson conversions. Uh, to differentiate them from the conversions that Remington just did on their own hook just a little bit later. So they took, Remington took their experience with Kitteridge and basically they decided to make bank on it because in 1869 Roland White's patent expired and Remington decided at that time to offer an improved uh, army conversion revolver. And the improvement really comes from the chambering. Uh, they still had the 46 rim fire that they offered, but the bulk of their revolvers they chambered for 44 Remington. 
uh, and a few made later, much later, in the, in the 1870s, were chambered for 45 Colt. Uh, and they offer them in their catalog. I don't know how they could make them fit in the cylinder, honestly, because they were six-shot models. Uh, but Remington did offer them, and I assume they did make them. But the bulk of their, their conversions that they made on their own hook were made in 44 Remington, which is dimensionally almost the same as 44 Colt. Uh, though it's got a little bit tighter tolerances than the 44 Colt. Uh, but once again, it's based on the old cap and ball revolver loading for that gun. So it's actually a 45 caliber heel base bullet, you know, loaded into a 44 case uh, with a shortened rim, much like the 44 Colt. Just like on the Kittredge conversions, uh, these guns had no loading gate. So it was a loading trough that was just a wide open straight shot into the cylinder. Uh, one thing they did have that the Kitteridge guns did not have was an ejector assembly. And that was a simple push rod. And it was fashioned uh, into the right side of the frame. And it was an L-shaped rod. <clears throat> so it had a finger groove that stuck out, you know, like a hockey stick, basically. And when you weren't using it, you flip that the hockey stick underneath the barrel, close the, the rammer, uh, the old cap and ball rammer up on it. There's a slot cut in that to uh, allow that um, L-shaped piece to be held up against the barrel so the ejector did not move while you're shooting it. Uh, very simple. Not fantastic to use. Not as good as the spring-loaded stuff on later Colts, but uh, fully effective and not very expensive to make, which was a big benefit for Remington. They were able to charge low prices. Now, un unfortunately, no good production data exists on how many Remington New Model Armies were converted uh, by the Remington factory itself, uh, except for the Kitteridge guns, because he did those as a single lot under his ownership. Um, the, the problem with a lot of these guns is that they did not bother recording a new serial range for them when they made them into conversions. So whatever gun they got on the used market to convert or whatever leftovers they had in the bin for parts, that was what they used. But the expectation is that it was not a great deal. There were not a great deal of these Army conversions made. And there were some similar conversions made by the Springfield uh, Arsenal. And they actually equipped troops with them as, as some trials in the late 1860s and very early 1870s. So a lot of guns are floating around uh, that look very similar, but they may not necessarily have been made in the Remington factory itself. Remington also converted new model Navy revolvers. So now let's talk about Remington Navy cartridge conversions. The, uh, unlike the Army that started, Army revolvers started being converted in 1868, Navy revolvers were not converted to cartridges until 1874. A lot of people don't realize that, but most of the Navy conversions were made between 1874 and as late as possibly 1890, certainly to 1887, when they appear in the catalog uh, listed still for sale. Um, so people often don't think of cartridge conversions being made that late in the 19th century. And, and the reason for it usually is because the cost was less than buying the purpose made for cartridges guns. And they were made either out of surplus parts or surplus revolvers that Remington was able to acquire for a low cost and the conversion was not very expensive. So they remained a staple of Remington's for some time. Now in 1875, the Navy came to Remington, U.S. Navy, and they, uh, they were looking to replace their cap and ball revolvers. And the primary choice they were facing in the marketplace was to buy Colt single-action army revolvers. And they thought they could maybe get a better deal if they took their existing Navy revolvers and had Remington convert them to fire cartridges. So it was a bit of an austerity move to forego buying the brand new 
Army approved um, cartridge firing six gun and instead take their old guns and pay to have them reworked uh, into cartridge firing revolvers and that's what they elected to do. So they took a lot of a thousand new model Navy revolvers and sent them to Remington where they were converted to 38, uh, 38 center fire by Remington for the sum of four dollars and twenty-five cents per gun, and as far as what it was entailed in that deal, they got a newly machined cylinder for that, brand new. The whole gun was polished and it was all reblued. So, really, at that price, uh, where a new gun would cost you about fifteen dollars to eighteen dollars. Uh, during that same period, uh, they felt like they were doing pretty good. They were getting off for four and a quarter and basically getting what amounted to a new gun. Now, the conversions were made for the civilian market in both centerfire and 38 rimfire versions. And of those, Remington seemed to prefer the 38 rimfire. In fact, by the time we get to their 87, 88 catalogs, they are only offering the gun in 38 rimfire. They're no longer offering center fire. Uh, so despite the fact that that's what the military wanted, uh, Remington seemed to find it was more popular and probably easier to produce to uh, make them just for rimfire guns. Now the new model Navy conversions were produced in a different manner from the Army conversions. And they are very distinct looking. So where the Army had a 3 seconds inch conversion plate uh, that was dovetailed in right up against a recoil shield. Uh, the Navy is quite different. The, the Navy has a much thicker conversion plate. And it has a loading gate built into it. And that loading gate closes and locks with a spring-loaded ball detent, which is kind of an interesting way to go. Um, so, we've got the thick conversion ring. And the other really distinct feature of Remington New Model Navy conversions is that the recoil shields behind the conversion ring are machined off. The back of the frame is slab-sided, right? You don't have those ears, shoulders, or whatever you want to call them, of the recoil shields coming out on both sides. Uh, instead, the conversion plate serves as a recoil shield. And it gives the gun a very distinctive look. Now, the new model navies were also equipped with an ejector assembly. It was also mounted on the right-hand side of the gun and operates the same way as the Army revolver's ejector assembly operates. Uh, and these the navies are, are good guns. I mean, they shoot a fairly light caliber, .38. It's a little bit of a heavy gun for that, but uh, they can handle anything you put through them as, as far as uh, black powder charges. So they are, are quite good. And because the cylinders are so long, these days we're able to load them for 38 special cases. So you can get a lot more. In fact, they will take 357 Magnum cases with the appropriate lead bullets seated over them. Uh, so you can really up the power factor on this gun if, if you want to with black powder. I, I don't see the need. I shoot my standard 38 Long Colts heel based out of it, uh, out of mine, and it does very well. But, of course, the lack of a recoil shield makes this instantly recognizable when you look at it. You know, it's a Navy cartridge conversion. Okay, so that is the Army uh, and the Navy conversions. Um, not a whole lot to them, but... I just want to finish off by talking about the modern replicas of Remington conversions because everybody is always interested in that. You're much more likely to have a replica than you are to have an original. I understand that. So people want to know how they stack up. And, of course, the two most prevalent cartridge conversion systems out there for Remingtons are the R&D uh, drop-in cylinder and the cursed drop-in cylinder. And the R&D is a two-piece cylinder that uh, you put the cartridges on one side and then you put a cap on that's secured by a pin 
and it rotates you know with the cylinder and it has firing pins built into it uh, that is an authentic Remington conversion technique except for the firing pins it would have been just a hole for the hammer to strike through but those two piece cylinders are very authentic just not to the army or the navy they were mostly used on the smaller Remingtons in fact I have a Remington police model revolver 30 you know, 38 rimfire uh, that's equipped with that kind of cylinder and and they're fantastic but they are really not uh, period correct for the army model now and now mind you I've got a bunch of them and I use them and I like them um, but are they historically correct for the army or the navy no they are not now the cursed cylinder is a little bit different that's also a two-piece but it has a fixed base plate uh, instead of one that caps onto the cylinder and, and revolves with it. Right? So the cylinder actually revolves per normal and the base plate stays stationary. It's not anchored to anything in the curse system. It's floating behind the cylinder. And then that works out okay. Uh, and some of the later ones come with a loading gate so you can grind away your recoil shield. Uh, grind a trough and load just like you would, you know, a standard, uh, say, single action army revolver. And they come with ejectors, Curacell's ejectors for them, and the whole bit. The ejectors are are pretty close to to the originals. Uh, functions the same. So, you know, what do I think of those? Well, to be honest with you, it's not a good conversion for the army because the conversion plate is about three times thicker than the fixed conversion plate on actual army conversions. So you can pretend it's a Navy model that's converted and it looks closer to that than anything else. Um, but of course it's still gonna have the recoil shield and you've got that floating back plate, which, which I have to say I'm not that fond of. Uh, but, but you may love them and that's fine. Uh, but once again, not authentic. Now the third conversion, I'll show you one right here, and I happen to prefer this to the cursed, is the actual made from scratch cartridge conversion that a birdie makes. Right, so they make this as a brand new gun, just like uh, just like Uberti makes Colt type cartridge conversions, the uh, Mason uh, Mason Williams or, or Mason conversions. So this is the same thing. This is made, it'll fire modern cartridges. The bore will be the right size for 38 Special, if you get it in 38 Special. Uh, this one's in 4440. And it comes closest to the Navy model, not the Army model. Because once again, it has this very thick um, conversion plate that, that has a gate. The gate functions differently than the gate on actual... Navy conversion because on an actual Navy conversion the gate stays closed because it has a spring-loaded ball detent at the top that goes into a little dimple up there to hold everything closed. This this has the standard Colt type spring spring-loaded loading gate uh, but it looks very similar. It lacks a little handle shelf that stands out on real Remington so you can flip it open easily. It has an ejector, just like a real Remington does. This would be a close enough approximation to the Navy revolver if it didn't have recoil shields, which it does. Because if you look at the Navy revolver closely, I'll show you some pictures of this, it does not. It is flat back there. Okay. And the Uberti replica is anything but flat back there. It has normal normal recoil shields on the back. So, my verdict, it gives you the flavor, but it doesn't taste exactly like a real Remington. So, I would say, of all the guns, all the Remingtons they make, the least like the originals are the cartridge conversions. Well, that wraps up our look at uh, Remington's Army and Navy size cartridge conversion revolvers. And I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know, give it a thumbs up, make a comment. That all plays around with the algorithm. 
and uh, YouTube ends up showing it to more people than it seems like they want to. <laughs> so helpful for me. Uh, and it messes with their heads a little bit, so I always like that. And I do read all of your comments, and I'm very happy to get them, and I respond to all of them that I can, as, as I think most of you know. And if you're not a subscriber, please feel free to subscribe. We're happy to have you on board. The next and final installment in the series will have us talking about Remington's purpose-made cartridge-firing revolvers, uh, better known as the 1875 and the 1890. And we'll even sneak in a little discussion on the 1888. So that'll be coming up. Stay tuned for it. And until next time, bye.